Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alain Belanger. I am the Secretary Treasurer of the Ontario Chapter. And uh, we are very happy that you have joined us today uh, for this presentation. Uh, Dr. Mark Rashid uh, is a senior structural engineer at Master Builders Solutions, where he serves as a technical resource to design professionals and end users of the company's products and specialty concrete technologies. Prior to joining Master Builders Solutions, he worked as an engineer at the American Concrete Institute. Dr. Rashid holds an MS and a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, as well as an MBA from the University of Michigan. He is a licensed professional civil engineer and a member of the American Concrete Institute, actively involved in several ACI committees, including ACI 544 Fiber Reinforced Concrete. So Mark, uh, please uh, go ahead and start the presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so today's topic is gonna be on fiber reinforced concrete. Now you've already covered my background. Uh, uh, I just added that uh, in the slide. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, I've worked in design, uh, I've worked in research, and I am a member of ACI 544. Uh, a lot of the information I'm gonna be presenting is based on uh, what's coming out of ACI 544. Um, I'm also doing more work on uh, residential concrete to find ways also to get uh, fibers in there. So that's a bit briefly about uh, myself. Now let's get into the topic about fiber reinforced concrete. What is fiber reinforced concrete? Well, uh, it's concrete plus fibers. So concrete is usually composed of uh, cementitious materials. So your cement and supplementary cementitious. Uh, water, aggregates, admixture, and we add, when we add fibers, we're basically making it fiber reinforced concrete. Now, there's only one reason for us to add fibers is uh, to improve mechanical properties of concrete. What do I mean? Well, we don't add the fibers to concrete to improve workability or finishability. That's not the point of fibers. We mainly add them to improve the hardened properties of concrete and specifically the mechanical properties. Now, throughout this presentation, I'll discuss this topic, but I'll start with a, a video just to give you an idea of what we get uh, by adding fibers to concrete. So the first video on the left that you see is an unreinforced slab, no uh, bar, no mesh, no fibers. As soon as it hits, uh, it just breaks completely. It shatters into uh, four pieces. While the other two, the one with the mesh, and fibers can basically uh, take more hits before shattering. Now, the fiber, as you can see, or the mesh, the reinforcement, does not stop the cracking from happening. It just keeps the concrete in one piece and basically controls how wide the crack is. So instead of having a concrete that's completely failed, uh, the fibers after the first hit controlled how big the crack was. Same thing with the mesh. So first point to uh, remember, and I'll hit that point again and again, is that fibers do not increase the capacity of concrete itself uh, before the concrete cracks. It only helps the concrete after the concrete cracks. And the type of fibers we typically use uh, or are available are steel, glass, synthetics, and natural fibers. Now, from a practical standpoint, steel and synthetics are the most used. I, I haven't seen much uh, natural fibers around and glass are, is only used in very specific applications. So most of this presentation will focus on steel and synthetic fibers. Um, I'm not gonna mention uh, glass and natural just because it's not something you you see in practice. Now, where are we using fibers? There's a huge amount of fibers being used in slabs on ground. Um, this is just uh, uh, one big application uh, that you see very commonly. Now, when we talk about slabs on ground, there's a lot of other structures with different names that uh, are actually very similar, or I would say the same, pavements, overlay, sidewalks. They all consist of flat work that's sitting on the ground. So that's a very common application of fibers and uh, an application where fibers have shown to uh, perform better than reinforcement. And uh, from a practical standpoint, they're much easier to uh, build than uh, using mesh uh, or uh, steel rebar, just because of the placement uh, 
simplicity of using fibers instead of having to have chairs uh, and uh, having um, uh, a contractor tie all the steel and uh, get it ready. So very common application is that. Now I'll talk a bit more about this and show a bit more pictures uh, briefly, but extending slabs and joint, that's an extension of the first one, but the use of fibers would also allow to reduce the amounts of joints we have as reinforcement would too. Uh, composite metal decks or concrete slab on metal deck uh, is another application. This is where the deck itself is being used as reinforcement and the concrete on top is mainly in compression and most of the reinforcement is uh, for uh, crack control. Um, that's one of the other applications that's very common for fiber reinforced concrete. I'll talk briefly about that and the standard that it's typically followed in North America. Uh, walls, especially residential walls, is another application where we're seeing fibers, and fibers are there mainly for crack control. Uh, a lot of these walls uh, would be uh, designed uh, more as a plain concrete structure. Um, again, I'll touch on this at the end a bit, but that's uh, an application that's uh, gaining grounds. Um, foundations. Now, you can use fibers in small foundations, some which are unreinforced, but we've also used them um, as uh, uh, an additional material to control cracks, uh, to replace regular reinforcement in some locations, but not in everything. So for example, if you look at this picture, we still have a lot of bars there uh, in the foundation. We just reduced some of that amount uh, and uh, replaced it with fibers. So we removed the reinforcement that was mostly there for crack control, the extra bars. Uh, while any reinforcement that was there to increase strength was kept. Uh, shotcrete underground construction, very common use of fibers. I won't get too much into it in this presentation. Then you have precast concrete. So all types of boxes uh, that you see on here, that's very common. Septic tanks, extremely common use of fibers and uh, something that uh, we as a company that works with fibers gets contacted about uh, all the time. You have vaults and any type of box structure is also available. Uh, circular more type of uh, structures, whether it's pipes, uh, concrete pipe, or these flare dents that you see on the left, that's a very common use of fibers. It's much simpler to be able to uh, use fibers and not have to put the mesh to accommodate uh, this shape. Uh, circular manholes, again, another application where you can replace a lot of the reinforcement in the manhole, basically everything that's in the wall, with just the macro fiber. And I'll talk more about different types of fibers. We also get into more into precast, whether uh, it's all these different shapes. So these are more like um, very dependent on where they're being used and how they're being used. But we've had experience using fibers in many different things where they've been very effective, where they've produced uh, these elements that work very well. Uh, and are also most uh, cost efficient for a producer. Again, more pictures uh, of what we use them. Okay, now um, going back to what I mentioned uh, at first, um, the use of fibers is really to improve the post-crack strength of the concrete. So that's the mechanical property we're looking at. Fibers, uh, no matter what their type is, whether they're steel fibers, they're macro synthetic fibers, whatever the shape is, whether it's twisted, embossed, they all always improve the post-crack. There's no improvement in pre-crack that uh, is measurable. So I'll, I'll discuss this more in details and show some results. But the idea behind the fibers is that we're using this continuous and randomly oriented uh, fibers, adding them into a matrix, which is our concrete, to improve the properties of the concrete. If you think about the reinforced concrete, we will, basically you have a continuous and aligned reinforcement. That's what the, is in reinforced concrete. While this continuous and randomly oriented is typically what we see in fibers. We don't have any material in concrete that's uh, discontinuous and aligned, but again, this picture is just to show the differences between those three. Now, concrete by itself is a composite material composed of paste and aggregate. And when we're adding fibers, we're not improving the concrete paste quality. And the concrete paste and the bond between the aggregate is usually what uh, uh, determines properties like modulus of rupture. The addition of fiber doesn't modify this, so we have no modification to the paste. Your glue is still the same. Uh, all it does is when the crack uh, starts, the fiber is going to arrest the crack 
and uh, stop it from developing uh, any further. So it's going to control more the crack width and at the same time uh, provide some strength beyond cracking. That's the main idea behind the, the use of fibers. Now, the fibers are, as you can see, going to be bridging between uh, uh, the concrete where the cracks happen. Uh, most failures in fibers are not going to be a breakage of fibers because those materials are very high strength. The problem with them is they are short, so most of the fiber uh, failure is going to be pull out uh, when it comes to uh, uh, pushing the fiber to the extreme. Now, um, a lot of this information, as you can see, and I'll talk uh, about this later, references ACI documents, ACI documents 544. So ACI has different committees, as uh, most of you are probably familiar with. ACI 544 is the expert committee on fiber reinforced concrete. And uh, I'll mention uh, a couple more documents later on. In general, though, if you're looking for more information from ACI on fibers, that's the resource I would recommend going to. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to split the uh, type of fibers into two, micros and macros. Uh, so the microfibers are, uh, I'll focus more on synthetic uh, microfibers. That's going to be a short part of the presentation, but it's important to separate them from the macrofibers. So the macros are going to be the synthetic macros and the steel fibers. These two that I have under macrofibers have properties that are very similar, and that's why we were lumping them into one. While well, the micros serve something completely different, and I'll discuss this in this next part. But to give you a bit of a separation as far as material before we talk about performance, a microsynthetic fiber has a, a different typically cut length that you would see uh, from a macro. So it's usually a shorter fiber in most applications, and uh, it's also a thinner fiber. That's the main difference. So the value that you see, that's the denier, that's going to uh, basically look at how thick a fiber is. So be, if you look at those two limits, that's what separates one from the other. Now, most of the material being used for uh, synthetics in general, whether it's micro or macros, in the market are polypropylene based. We do see some nylons out there, but most of the fibers are polypropylene. So now let's get into microfibers. What are they? What do we use them for? So Within the microfiber family, there are two types. There's one that's called the monofilament fiber and another which is called the fibrillated fibers. Now, again, most of these are going to be polypropylene based um, and the use of the fibers is going to be focused, as I'm going to talk about, on plastic shrinkage. The monofilaments are used at dosages usually between 0.3 and 0.9 kilograms, uh, while the fibrillated ones are typically used at a single dosage of 0.9. Now, this type of fiber is not supposed to be replacing any reinforcement. As I'll uh, talk a bit later about it in the coming slides, this is most, mostly for plastic shrinkage. Now, there has been some experience in residential concrete. I would say this is more US than Canada, where um, they got used to replacing uh, a, a very uh, light wire mesh, that's 6x6 six six W1.4, which I think is a, a 154 in uh, some of the Canadian uh, numbers that are used. Uh, they, they're used to replacing this type of uh, mesh uh, with a fibrillated fiber. Now, this is only typically done for these residential type of application. And uh, other than that, this type of fiber does not replace any reinforcement. It's just an addition to improve uh, performance as far as plastic shrinkage. Now, what's plastic shrinkage? Well, it's uh, uh, shrinkage that happens early on when the concrete is plastic. I'll talk why it happens. The way it looks is, uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, they're shallow cracks, they uh, have a random pattern, and their width is uh, around one eighth of an inch. Spacing and length, so they can be anywhere from inches to feet. Uh, they're not uh, continuous all over the slab. Now here's a picture of uh, how they would look in real life. Uh, you can see they're not uh, continuously going from one side to the other. And when you look at the core of concrete, uh, you can see that the crack doesn't extend the full depth. So they're really more surface uh, type cracking and um, they're mostly a visual issue, uh, not something typically that uh, would uh, affect the performance of the slab overall, um, at least as far as carrying loads. Now, why, are, why is plastic shrinkage occurring? Well, um, under certain uh, condition, 
uh, we might get an evaporation rate that's uh, worse than the bleed rate of concrete. So you have bleeding that's uh, getting water back up to the top of the concrete while evaporation is making the surface of the concrete lose uh, water. If the um, evaporation rate is higher than the bleed rate, then there's a, a differential that happens between the bottom of the concrete and the top. The top is more dry. That causes uh, tension forces. Now, at this stage, concrete is still very weak. It's still plastic and hasn't developed its strength. So if the stress caused by this is higher than the capacity, then concrete cracks. Now, what drives evaporation, as you can imagine, is uh, uh, concrete temperature is something, ambient temperature affected, wind and humidity definitely are uh, all factors that affect that. What affects bleeding is uh, the, uh, the type of mix you have, your water cementitious ratio, uh, the supplementary cementitious you use, et cetera. All this is going to affect what your rate of bleeding is. So a lot of this can be calculated, and in some conditions, fibers are one of the solutions that could be used. Now, fiber isn't the only solution. Uh, there are others that uh, need to be uh, also uh, employed in some cases. Sometimes, depending on how bad situations are, you can get away with just using one. Uh, other times, you uh, might have to use more than one way to resolve a, a problem with plastic shrinkage. Now, as far as uh, evaluating the fibers and knowing how well it can perform under those conditions, ASTM has a test method that's ASTM 1579. And this is, uh, uh, it's basically what you see. It's concrete put in this chamber where we are trying to replicate actual life uh, by uh, dehumidifying uh, uh, the box where this uh, is occurring, heating it. So we're creating all the conditions that uh, might cause evaporation. After uh, doing this, we can compare a concrete sample with and without fibers. Uh, and based on that, we can calculate the a value called the crack reduction ratio. And that's going to tell us how much improvement we get as far as performance of our concrete when we use a certain uh, type of fiber and a certain at a certain dosage. That's what we get out of uh, this test method. Excuse me. Now, the higher the CRR value we get, that means the better the performance of the fiber. Now, when it comes to different types of fibers, um, uh, the, the main thing for us is to understand what the performance uh, of the fiber is in concrete. And as I mentioned, that's what this ASTM test uh, does. Now, some people, and we see sometimes that in specification, believe that uh, uh, using fibers with higher tensile strength is actually something that improves the performance of the concrete. And uh, based on the testing that I'm showing on here, this I believe was done by a DOT in the United States, comparing different uh, fibers from uh, fibrillated to monofilaments, uh, even they even had PVAs, uh, comparing all of them and looking at strength versus performance in the ASTM standard shows that uh, uh, strength is not really the most important thing on there. There's different thing about the fibers that allow them to perform better, and that's because the fibers, as I mentioned earlier, do not fail as a function of breaking. It's more a slippage. So the length of the fiber is a factor, the shape, the thickness, all of these have to be taken into consideration um, when choosing a fiber to get the best performance. That's why when you're looking to uh, use a fiber on your project, you shouldn't be specifying prescriptive type uh, numbers, like uh, applying tensile strength or something like that, or saying, I want this shape or that shape. It's very hard to predict how they're going to perform unless you actually test them. So the typical language we recommend for using this type of fiber in concrete is to apply a crack reduction ratio. Uh, the old ACI uh, residential code, for example, used to have a number of 40%. Uh, now, the most common numbers I see are around 85. That's what people uh, typically put in their specification. And the language, as I'm showing here, would serve that purpose, where you begin by requiring fibers that meet uh, the ASTM standard for fibers, um, then uh, putting your performance requirement without talking about tensile, without uh, strength, without talking about uh, length of fibers, none of that should be relevant to an engineer specifying. You should just be specifying the performance you're looking for. Same thing with fibrillated, and these type of values are typically available with any fiber manufacturer that uh, sells this type of product. 
they would know what dosage, if they're using a monofilament, uh, would be required to get the performance that you're looking for. Okay, now this is all I have for microfibers. Now let's move to macrofibers, which is the main uh, um, topic of this presentation and the type of fiber that has a lot more usage than micros. So as I mentioned, macrofibers uh, consist of steel fibers. So you have, uh, based on the ASTM standards, five types of steel fibers, so type one, two, three, four, and five. Now, as far as performance in concrete, I'll talk about how we measure it. Typically, a type one is the one that would perform better than uh, any of the other types. Um, there's also now, uh, um, and this is uh, growing very fast, there's also a, a fiber, which is a type one fiber, but it's a bit different than uh, what's uh, typically used as far as steel fibers for a normal application. There is a, a UHPC type fiber. Uh, you see some pictures on it here. And this is a thinner type of fiber. Sometimes they're even calling it a, a micro steel fiber. Uh, it's shorter in length than we typically see, uh, but uh, this use is mostly for ultra high performance concrete or it's being known as UHPC. Now in this presentation, I don't cover UHPC. It's a topic on its own, but if you have questions later on on the topic, please reach out. Uh, fiber reinforced concrete also uh, can be made with synthetic fibers. And we're talking this time about macro synthetic fibers. Now, as I mentioned, most of these are polypropylene, polyolefin based, and uh, uh, they have to meet this ASTM standard, the D7508. Now, what's the advantage of uh, using these fibers over other? Uh, as far as durability goes, well, one, they don't absorb water, they don't react with alkalis, and unlike steel fibers, they don't corrode. That's a big thing. Also, these fibers don't have any type of reaction that can occur in concrete. Um, once they're there, they're very durable, as opposed to even a steel fiber where sometimes um, to prevent corrosion, some coatings are added, and these coatings can actually cause more problems than just corrosion. So this is an example of a steel fiber, for example, that, was, uh, 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 that had a zinc coating. And uh, after it was mixed in the concrete and uh, um, the concrete set, it basically created some air bubbles, uh, a lot more than you would want for any type of freeze thaw, obviously, but the zinc reaction in a basic uh, uh, type of material causes this type of air bubble. So again, this is something we don't see in synthetics and one of the big advantages of why they're being used. Now, one issue we have with fibers in general, unlike uh, other reinforcement, uh, is that there is a big uh, variety of fibers out there, whether it's shape, material, and all these kind of uh, different aspects of the fibers. So you can find the hooked fiber, you can find the twisted steel fibers. Uh, as far as steel, uh, you can find crimp shaped. Uh, that's as far as steel. When you look at synthetics, you can see a stick fiber, a rope fiber, a tape fiber. So they all have different uh, structure. Some of them have embossments, some of them don't. And it's hard to say that one fiber is going to be equal to the other because that's not the performance we see in concrete. So in this case also, prescriptive type specifications have been used, but they're not the most efficient and effective ways of using fibers. Uh, the industry is moving more to a performance type specification where we want the engineers to uh, uh, choose what type of performance they're looking for, specify that in the project, uh, other than uh, just putting a dosage of fibers because the dosages aren't always equivalent. And even by using dosages of fibers, you're not always putting the most efficient uh, um, fiber out there because one fiber uh, can have a similar performance to the other minus using a, a, or um, with the, uh, you can get the same performance with less of the fiber basically if you're comparing two to each other. Now, as far as mechanical properties of fibers, as I mentioned before, there are some properties which are improved with fibers, but there are also some properties which are not. So this is a list of uh, uh, what fibers improve. Crack control is the most common thing we use fibers for. I would say it's 70 to 80% of the usage of fiber is controlling cracks. Post-crack tensile and flexural strength, these are too common. Shear strength is also out there. That's a common thing with steel fibers and uh, some codes like ACI's 318 allow it for a very specific application for shear strength uh, improvement. Fatigue resistance, sorry. 
fire resistant, impact resistant, ductility, energy absorption, all these uh, are properties that are associated with the use of fibers. Now, the properties that are not improved by fibers are compressor strength. We actually don't see an improvement in compressor strength, especially at the typical dosages being used. Sometimes uh, when not enough paste is uh, used in the concrete, we can see a small drop in compressor strength. Pre-crack fracture strength or modulus of rupture. So this is the point where the concrete cracks. That typically is not affected by fibers because the fibers are only gonna activate after the concrete cracks. Modulus of elasticity is also not uh, uh, changed by fibers. Now, getting more into testing of concrete, if we're looking at ACI documents that describe all the different tests available, ACI 544.9 is a report for measuring uh, mechanical properties of hardened uh, reinforced concrete. Now, this uh, document lists uh, a long range of uh, test methods to uh, measure a lot of different properties of fibers. In most cases, however, as far as the application, we don't need all those test results to uh, be able to determine a fiber dosage. And the reason we need to determine a fiber dosage, as I mentioned before, is that we don't know how the different fibers are gonna perform. So we need the performance uh, requirement. And then based on testing that we've done on different products, we know that we need a uh, dosage of X to produce the property that we're looking for. As far as uh, what's mostly used uh, in uh, application um, for testing fibers, you have ASTM C1399, which is a beam test. This test is still out there, but it's being phased out uh, and being replaced by ASTM 1609, which has become the main standard that everyone uses for testing fibers. ASTM C1550 is also there, but that's a test that's mostly related to shotcrete. I'm not gonna talk much about it, but that's really the point of this test. Um, it's not very easy to be shooting concrete uh, in a beam. Um, so this is why this type of test is convenient, where uh, a circular panel can be used and then tested and the toughness of the concrete can be determined. And this is a, a typical example of uh, what the type of results you would be getting out of this. Okay, now, as I mentioned, the main test for testing uh, fiber reinforced concrete is ASTM 1609. It's a beam test. This test is different than what's uh, used by the Europeans. Uh, we're loading the beams at two points, uh, uh, creating a, a constant moment where we expect the crack to happen and uh, uh, looking at how much deflection we get uh, out of uh, the test, basically with fibers post-crack. So uh, just to give you an idea of how the test would be run when it's done, and I'll show more of the results. So this is the curve uh, increasing in strength. This is where the concrete cracks uh, on the top. And the, what you see the line that's continuing there is what we call the post-crack strength of the concrete. So this is the strength you have after the concrete has cracked. This is a, a picture looking at the bottom of the beam where you can see that, yes, the concrete did crack, but it's still holding together. And in this case, there is some uh, strain hardening occurring, at least uh, post-crack. Now, just a comparison, so you see the difference between uh, using fibers and no fibers. This is the beam test I was talking about. So this is after the concrete cracks when it has fibers, and typically with reinforcement. When uh, the, there are no fibers or reinforcement, that's the zero strength you get because there's nothing uh, there to uh, hold the crack after it breaks. So this is just a side-by-side -side comparison. So you have small crack versus a uh, uh, big crack or the concrete just put into two pieces. Uh, okay. So now, when do, what do we get out of this test? As I showed you, this test uh, starts by uh, loading the beam until the beam cracks, and that's where you hit your first peak. So this is your modulus of rupture. Now, with plain concrete, as you saw, you just get failure after you hit that maximum. With fiber reinforced concrete, you're getting a post-crack strength, and that's what you see in blue and red. Now, the difference between blue and red could be a different type of fiber, or it could be a higher dosage of the same fiber. That's what, give, what gives you better performance and increased post-crack strength. Now, ACI 544, again, uh, describes uh, 
the type of uh, performance you get on here. So this is showing a, a hardening branch, a softening branch, and explain uh, explains all this in more detail. So if you want to understand also uh, more, not just about the test, but ab about how to use it, ACI 544.4 is uh, uh, the reference I would recommend looking. For design purposes, if we just look at one line, the values we typically use are gonna be the toughness. So that's the area under the curve, but we don't uh, call it just the toughness these days. We use a, um, a terminology called FE3, which is the equivalent residual strength. And we typically use this type of value for designing something like a slab on ground. So a continuously supported member that um, could be just sitting on the ground or it could be like a composite metal deck. That's the typical value we would use. For everything else using fibers, we use the point that's at the end of the curve, not the toughness. So this is the actual residual strength at the end of the test. And it's uh, the terminology used in ASTM is FD150. So you would use this if you're uh, designing members which are discontinuous, something like a wall, uh, or discontinuously supported, that's what I mean. Uh, last thing to note here, uh, for those of you that have been dealing with fibers for a long time, you've probably seen the value RE3, which is a value that's a, a percentage value. It's not an MPAs or PSI. It's not a stress or strength. And all that value is, is the FE3 divided by the modulus of rupture. So if we get this value divided by this peak value, we get a value that's in percentage. That terminology used to be used a lot and values would range anywhere from 20 to, depending on your need, going up to maybe up to 100 and with very high dosage could even go more. Now, these days we're moving away uh, in ACI documents of using RE3, at least as far as ACI 544, and we're focusing more on looking at the value as a stress because that's a more meaningful thing to uh, be considering. Now, here's a typical report, and um, I'll apologize, this is not a metric. This is a report uh, uh, for us that uh, uh, we've done on some of our fibers. So whenever we have a new fiber, we get it evaluated by a third party a testing agency just to uh, see what values and what performance we can get out of it. And the report would describe the mix. It would show the curves as I showed you. Um, any time we test this type of uh, um, uh, fiber, we don't do one beam, obviously. We test, in this case, six beams. Uh, sometimes we even do more, uh, so we get a good uh, idea of what the performance would be. And um, in some type of fibers at higher dosages, sometimes these curves don't align very well. There is more variability um, just because of the nature of this uh, type of product. Now, this example is the synthetic fibers, and you can see it's very consistent as far as performance. When we go up to higher dosages, yeah, you can see a bit more variability, but typically they're very consistent as far as uh, how they perform. We also get the table, a summary, and these tables will let us know what dosages to use depending on what stress someone is trying to design for. So if you were to call me and uh, you wanted to uh, uh, look for a dosage that uh, met, uh, say, uh, uh, an FE3 of 100 PSI, then looking at this, I would tell you this is 1.8 kilograms or what you see as three pounds on here. So that's how we would be looking at determining dosages. Now, the question uh, that, uh, of course, comes up is, how do I know how many MPAs or PSIs I need uh, for my application? And this is what, where documents or design guides in ACI are very helpful. So there are a lot of codes out there, whether it's uh, US or Canadian codes, that would allow you to use fibers or not. Um, and those are very good to let us know where, which applications are needed. The documents like ACI 544 and 360 will actually walk you through an example, if you're a designer, on uh, determining how much fibers do you need. So ACI 544, as I mentioned, is the ACI document which has the most information on design of fibers. But then a document like 360, which is on slabs on ground, will also cover in some part fibers. And there are other documents, whether it's Shotcrete and for and different applications, where all this information uh, is going to be found specific to the usage uh, or the application that you're looking for. 
Uh, now, what does ACI 544 give us? Well, it gives us some equations we can use uh, to re relate some properties of concrete. So, for example, if we're trying to look at the tensile capacity using a beam test, which is testing flexural, we get a simple equation to convert between one to the other. We also get the comparison of how uh, fiber reinforced concrete compares to uh, regular reinforced concrete and how we can determine the capacity of the concrete as far as getting the flexural capacity or moment capacity out of it. So all this information is in ACI 544. Uh, for the sake of time in this presentation, I won't get into uh, uh, showing calculations, but if this is a topic you're interested in, uh, please check out ACI 544 and also email me. Um, we're, there are some examples uh, in that document, but we're also, uh, as part of the committee, working on adding more. Obviously, it also covers topics on how to uh, um, uh, design whenever you have both three bar and the um, and fibers, and this is what we typically call hybrids. So you'd be looking at contribution from your steel and contribution from your fibers. Okay, now talking more about the design of fibers, um, I'll discuss a bit slabs on ground because this is a very common usage of fibers. One of the main questions we always get with slabs on ground is what's the minimum reinforcement needed and where should the uh, rebar typically be used? Um, so whenever we look uh, at what engineers have done, we've seen very different things. Some people put the bar in the top, some people in the middle, some people just put it at the bottom. And sometimes there's engineers that do different things. They put top and bottom. Um, and some of that uh, is good, it improves the performance, but some of it is actually not needed. And I'll explain a bit why uh, and the different types of slabs that are available. So ACI 360 the, discusses different types of slabs. Um, and in general, a lot of the slabs we see every day are unreinforced slab. Uh, and sometimes they do get a lot more reinforcement than they need. And I'll explain uh, that. So when I'm referring, by the way, to unreinforced slab, I'm also including lightly reinforced slab. That means that uh, they're slabs on ground with minimum reinforcement. They don't have any reinforcement to actually increase strength. They're mostly looking to controlling uh, crack width. Reinforced concrete slab, is controlling crack width with uh, some reinforcement, but might be doing a bit more than that. It might be also using reinforcement to increase flexural capacity and limit the thickness of the slab. Now the purple and the red are um, diff um, special types of slabs. Some of them are using different materials. For example, a purple one that you see on here could be using a shrinkage compensating concrete um, just to prevent the concrete from uh, even cracking or it could be something like a post tension. This is another type, not the most common there, but also there. And then the last one is a structural slab, and this typically um, gets a bit more complicated. I won't get into it, but this is where the slab is designed more like an elevated slab than it is as a slab on ground, uh, or it could be more as a foundation, just because it's picking up loads coming from the building and not just uh, uh, service loads coming from uh, objects moving on the slab. Now with our typical slab, the non-structural one, the one that doesn't have to meet the building code, the loads we typically have would be something say like a, a forklift moving on there. It could be a post load, it could be different things, but it's typically not the building load. It's not the column that's sitting directly on the slab. Columns would be separated and would have their own foundation and not linked to the slab in this application. You also have your uh, volume change, whether it's expansion and contraction. These are elements uh, which we would consider, and these are important as far as, far as looking as uh, joint spacing. So in your typical slab on ground, if you don't do anything and you just cast concrete, you're gonna get the big shrinkage crack. That's very common, and we typically see it when the joints are not cut deep enough or when there's no joints at all and no other type of mechanism to control crack width. Now, uh, this is an example of that. how would that look. So as opposed to a plastic shrinkage, this type of sh uh, shrinkage crack, the drying shrinkage, it just goes all the way through the slab uh, from uh, one location to the other. It, they're not discontinuous, they're all aligned into one location. Now, for this type of unreinforced concrete, um, the way we typically design it is we have joints, and the joints are 
just location we chose for the concrete to crack. So we weakened the, uh, a certain uh, portion of the concrete, that's where we cut the joint. So now the area under the joint is uh, smaller than the area around it. So you have a, a, a smaller depth and that induces a crack on there. Now, one thing wherever we uh, typically want to have a joint, uh, in some cases where large loads are applied, we typically want uh, to still have some continuity between the uh, two pieces of the slab as far as uh, transferring shear between one and the other. And that's what, when we typically use dowels. Now, dowels are used in some applications depending typically on loads and thicknesses because thicknesses are uh, uh, calculated based on loads. Um, and uh, they're there mainly to uh, replace uh, or to uh, provide the continuity between the two pieces of the concrete. Now, just having a dowel and just having plain concrete is typically not enough for us. That's why we used what we call uh, lightly reinforced concrete, where we put a small amount of reinforcement between the joints to control any cracking that might happen. Now, if we look at ACI 360 recommendation, that amount is usually 0.1%. I know in Canada, the standard is typically 0.2%, and I've seen it on most projects. But that amount of reinforcement is good, it works. It's a lot more conservative than what an ACI document is recommending for this type of uh, application. At the joint, however, we make sure that we don't have too much reinforcement crossing there, because if we do, the joint might not activate and our crack uh, might not happen at the joint, it might happen next to the joint, which would defeat the point of having the joint. So one note that's important, is to always make sure that the reinforcement going between this is 0.1% uh, uh, or lower. And that's because this reinforcement uh, would basically uh, stop this from uh, activating. Unlike the smooth dowel that uh, wouldn't be locking in the slab, this reinforcement could be a problem in, uh, if too much is being added. Now, all this can be done the same way with fiber reinforced concrete. And uh, what we would typically use for minimum reinforcement, instead of 0.1%, we would use a 0.69 or 0.7 MPA. That's the value that uh, we consider to be the minimum as far as uh, fiber reinforced concrete and uh, its uh, usage for minimum crack control uh, compared to what you saw earlier. Again, this is what we call here a lightly reinforced concrete. 100 PSI is uh, equivalent uh, if you're looking at it from a crack control uh, and a slab on ground to uh, the 0.1%. So if you're looking for something more than 0.1%, then this value would go up. So if we're looking at 0.2%, this would be a 200 PSI. If we're looking at uh, uh, 0.18, it's 180. So the values actually turn out to be very easy when you look at PSIs and MPAs, they're not as uh, simple to relate to percentage of reinforcement. Now, the type of uh, slab I just mentioned with joints uh, is typically using uh, uh, this type of recommendation as far as joint spacing. And this is out of ACI 360. Um, it's the same one that uh, you would find when you look at the document. I just uh, redrew it and put some colors, but you can see uh, the meters uh, and the millimeter thickness, or if you want to use inches, uh, and that's typically the recommendation that most people use as far as joint spacing. So most people are just assuming the concrete is high shrinkage, and that's why a lot of the joint uh, spacing limits are around this 4.5 uh, meters or the 15 feet. Now, going back to uh, another type of slab, the reinforced one. So that's a more advanced version of what I showed you. Here, uh, we still have a dowel, we still have the reinforcement, and we can add the bottom bar at the bottom. That's not gonna stop the joint from opening uh, because of its location. Uh, and this type of uh, reinforcement will typically increase the capacity of your concrete. Now we can also remove the joint and put the high amount of reinforcement. Uh, ACI 360 recommends more than 0.5%. Uh, Others uh, similar to slabs sometimes even recommend more. And what this type of reinforcement does is it doesn't stop cracking as I mentioned, it controls the crack width. 
it makes sure your crack doesn't open up and uh, is very visible. But you're going to have to add a lot of reinforcement to achieve that. As I mentioned, it's 0.5%, and sometimes I've seen much higher than that. The same application can also be done with fibers, where you use a high amount of uh, or dosage of fibers to control cracking at the surface and eliminate joints. Now, sometimes we help the concrete also with fiber reinforced concrete by using a low shrinkage concrete and doing different things just to control how much cracking might occur. If you're looking at post crack flexural strength or replacing the bar you saw at the bottom, you can also do this with a higher dosage of fiber. ACI 360 and the new upcoming revision, whenever that gets released, has kind of put the recommendation of a 200 PSI. Of FF3 or 1.3 MPA um, for this type of application. So, this has not been uh, out there, but it's basically if you want to get increased capacity, you can do it by adding higher dosages of fibers. Now, when I talked about extended joints, just to give you an idea what I mean by this, this is a building plan and the red lines are the joint spacing. If you're looking to expand, you can go to something like this or something like that. And these are projects that um, we do all the time. They work very well. And um, this is an example of a 50 by 50 feet or 15 meter by 15 meter joint spacing. So that's much higher than your typical uh, recommended by ACI 360. Um, this is another example. So these are becoming more common and sometimes being requested by owners that uh, don't want to uh, spend too much time maintaining joints. Um, because joints could be, their maintenance could be a big cost in maintaining the slab in the future. That's where most of the repairs typically go. So again, just some examples to show you. It's a common application that we've done a lot in North America. This is even a circular tank, uh, uh, not even a rectangular one, and that works. Okay, now uh, moving on, composite metal deck. I showed some picture earlier on. The concept of composite metal deck uh, using fibers is very uh, similar to slabs on ground. The standard that's being used in North America refers to this uh, composite steel floor deck slab uh, standard. That's the most common one we see everywhere. And uh, this standard uh, allows for use of steel and synthetic fibers. Uh, it says that uh, you can only use it for temperature and shrinkage, so you can't use it to increase the strength capacity of your slab. Uh, and um, this uh, standard uh, requires uh, a recommendation from a fiber manufacturer, as you can see on here, but also sets a minimum limit of 14.8 uh, kgs as far as uh, uh, steel fibers and 2.4 as far as uh, uh, synthetic macrofibers. So these are the minimums that can be used for this uh, application. And again, this application is only there for temperature and shrinkage. Now, knowing all these uh, limits and the requirements, um, whether we're looking at slabs or we're looking at, um, uh, at using a composite metal deck, you can use language very similar <clears throat> to what I showed you earlier, where you can require um, a certain amount of macrofiber based on the performance you need. And this would be the language you use. Um, this one is for uh, synthetic macrofibers, and this one is for steel fibers. The second line would be uh, making a requirement for performance, and this is your FE3 values, whether it's in PSI or MPA, you can put whatever you want on there. Um, if you're doing a composite metal deck, you add the, the language I have on here that's in orange, which puts a minimum uh, um, dosage of fibers that cannot be lower than the minimum that that standard is um, requiring. Now, a lot of this for slab on ground has actually now been made uh, in a new ACI specification that should be released in the next couple of months, and that would uh, address the performance aspect of uh, specifying fibers and determining dosages. For composite metal deck, that's not covered, but it might be something we do in the future. Okay, last application I just want to touch on quickly is using fibers and walls. Uh, so 
this is say a basement wall which are usually lightly reinforced we can go where we have two layers of reinforcement to basically having one layer where one layer is uh, providing strength and the other is just uh, controlling cracks now by adding more fibers or increasing concrete strength we can also play around with this where we can remove the bars and, and come up with uh, what we call a plain concrete wall design we can also obviously uh, still go to this plain concrete design if we had no vertical bars. So under all these applications, we can use fibers either as a hybrid or as a standalone reinforcement. Again, we're talking about lightly reinforced walls. This is not building application, it's mostly residential. Last topic to uh, uh, bring up here is workability and finishability of fiber reinforced concrete. So uh, from a design standpoint, it's, uh, mechanical properties are extremely important. But when it comes to construction, we also have to take into account workability and finishability. So mechanical performance, as I said, is important. Aesthetics, in some cases, is also very important. Um, if you compare different types of fibers, when you look at them before they're mixed in concrete, they might look nice, as what you see on the left. But once they're in concrete and mixed, they could look like hair. And that's uh, synthetics. Steel fibers aren't going to change their looks that much but you'll get the same results in concrete sometimes uh, of having, uh, they won't be called the hairy uh, slab, but where uh, a fiber can be sticking out uh, if the concrete is not uh, um, proportioned properly for the type of fiber that's being used. So some of the issues we might see in the field are fiber balls that are due to poor fiber distribution, some mixed segregation, and that's what you see on here. A good fiber distribution, though, is uh, very common if everything is done proper, and that's what we typically would want to see on there. Uh, so a hairy slab, this is an example of a concrete that was not properly designed, didn't have enough paste, versus uh, the same exact fiber being used in an application where you can barely see anything. So it almost looks uh, like there was no fiber being used on there. So all this, there is a factor that is the type of fiber that's important there, but a lot of it can be controlled just with the adjustments to the mix of a concrete mix. So um, every time we have a concrete that contains fibers, depending on the dosage, uh, if the dosage is low, uh, many times there's no adjustment needed or nothing too significant. But if we're using high fiber dosages, there needs to be a, a change in the mix and when I mean by a change, it's not just using more admixture. It should be mostly increasing your paste content because you're going to need more cement paste to coat the fiber to get the appearance that you need. And again, mix adjustments are very important and uh, they're always uh, related to the fiber those are just being used and the type of fiber. So that's also a factor uh, in determining all of this. Now, this is what I have. Uh, thank you for listening. And we can open now uh, the floor for uh, questions, if you have any. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Great presentation. Um, yes, you can type in your uh, questions if you do have some. Uh, I have a first one here that says uh, that's asking, what routes are fiber suppliers taking to get to more specifiers in the initial design stage to promote replacing steel with macro fibers where applicable and have them specified as an alternative to steel? No, that's a good question. Um, one of the routes I would say personally I'm taking is uh, making, uh, making it simpler for engineers to understand how to design with fibers. So for example, in ACI 544, we're creating design examples because one of the things engineers uh, don't like is looking at documents that are purely theoretical and don't show easy examples on how to use something. So this is part of the education part that we're doing, uh, at least you know, in general as an industry there. Now, as far as uh, other efforts, each fiber manufacturer does things differently. Everyone's doing seminars, uh, or webinars uh, to educate people, but a lot of the work I think that's being combined with from everyone is making changes and uh, providing all this information to engineers via organizations like ACI. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, I'm just uh, waiting to see if there are going to be other questions here typed in. Uh, that looks like the only question. So, uh, Mark, uh, if uh, I thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, right. If any of the attendees have um, any other questions, you can uh, email them to uh, the chapter, ACIOntario at gmail.com. Uh, or, Mark, um, I don't know if uh, we have been publicized your email address or if you want an email address publicized. Sure. Um, Let me uh, uh, show my email address. I had them at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> sorry, scrolling uh, very fast. That's so okay. this is my yeah. uh, email address in blue uh, and my phone number if you have any questions on the topic or any, really uh, anything related to concrete materials, please let me know. All right, we uh, we shall. Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this afternoon. Um, just a reminder that uh, the chapter is hosting the ACI convention in the spring of uh, 2025. It will be our um, fifth time hosting uh, the ACI convention. Uh, and there's going to be lots of news coming out very shortly, so uh, stay tuned. So uh, once again, uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, we hope to uh, see you uh, very soon at uh, another event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye for now.